Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Brooklyn Interactive Group's show dedicated to domestic violence. But the topics have been expanded since COVID because there was so much happening during COVID. I'm Susan Howard, the local domestic violence attorney. And the content of the show are, are mine and my guest. And today, most special, talented, talented guest, Susan Park. Susan, welcome. Thank you, Susan. Thanks for having me today. Oh, I'm thrilled to have you. Um, Susan's a local Brookline resident. She's an activist. She's an author. She's, I'm going to let her tell you. Susan, tell us a little bit about your background. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, so my name is Susan Park. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm a town meeting member in Precinct 17. I used to be a town meeting member for Precinct 2. And then, um, you know, when they redrew the lines, I'm now 17. But um, I'm also, I, I, I have a little, a lot of different hats I wear. And like Susan said, I'm a children's author. I, you know, for a while did some freelance reporting and, um, and I've, I've volunteered a lot um, for the schools and different committees and such. And I have three daughters and a husband and one furry dog named Quincy. Let's see Quincy. Is Quincy with you? Yeah. Would you like to see Quincy? Okay. Yeah, sure. And Quincy is actually on the cover of, um, well, actually, this is Quincy. Oh. Hi, Quincy. Hi. Oh, what Hi. a cutie. Quincy is... Hard Shih Tzu or not? Quincy is multi Shih Tzu. Oh, Quincy. So how old is Quincy? He just turned four. Wow, he's young. Mm -hmm. Well, welcome, Quincy. And you can chime in because I have a Bailey who chimes in whenever. <laughs> Susan, um, you have a wide range of interests, but I know one of your interests is mental health. Yes. How, am I correct? Could you just introduce us to your the, the reason you are so concerned about mental health and has your concern grown in the last couple of years? Okay. Yeah. Great question, Susan. So what I noticed is that during COVID, um, you know, I was writing um, stories for the Brooklyn tab and I would talk to the um, health commissioner and he would tell me about the rising mental health concerns in our schools. And um, so I, I would just kind of watch that because, you know, I'm a mom, I have three girls and, you know, just the the wellness of students and children is very important to me because I used to be a high school English teacher. I used to teach 11th and 12th grade. And, um, and I noticed that in May of this past year, the uh, Surgeon General he made an advisory statement saying that there's a mental health crisis in our country. And, um, you know, I like to read, I just see what's on the news. And so I've kind of been following that. And then I've also been on the, um, I'm on the Brookline Parent Education Network Advisory Committee. And what that is in town is um, we, we meet uh, periodically and we talk about issues that we might see in the school. And then um, our director, she will, you know, help put a program together and bring education to parents and the mental health definitely came up. And so it's, you know, the fact that there's a mental health crisis and, and actually, well, okay. Cause I, I actually knew people who, um, friends who had kids who during COVID, it was a really difficult time. And so I kind of followed up on that. But Susan isn't part of the problem. Just from my reading, I do substitute teach um, mentally challenged adolescents, mainly those who have eating disorders, anorexia. Um, and I went into that three years ago when I was recruited because I wanted to learn about trauma. And to be quite frank, I didn't want to read. I didn't want to take classes. I don't want to do. I wanted to experience. And it's been quite an experience. But do you think part of the crisis today is because there aren't enough um, resources aren't enough therapists, there aren't enough psychologists, there aren't enough social workers. That's what I'm reading. The kids, particularly young people, are lined up in hospital emergency room hall hallways, sometimes for weeks, waiting for a bed and somebody to help them. Is that part of the problem? Yeah, you're absolutely right, Susan. In fact, I just read I just read recently that there's a shortage of five million mental mental health care professionals. They need five million 
in the next, I forget what the exact st stats is, but there's a shortage for sure. Oh my goodness. So, so what do we do about the shortage? And also when you're talking about the schools, I know being a domestic violence attorney, that there's a lot of bullying in schools. There's a lot of sexting in schools. There's even trafficking. Yes, in the Brookline schools. Can you address any of those issues and what your solution would be to try to curb some of those things? Yeah, Susan, I really think that if you see something, say something. You to know? whom? So it's really important to reach out to the guidance counselors at school, your your uh, your students' teachers, the principals, you know, all the um, Brookline schools, they have, they usually have a PTO coffee. It's really important to, you know, maybe get there and listen to some of the conversations that are going on. And, and if parents can't make it there, then absolutely they need to just reach out to their, their teachers and admin because, you know, nothing changes if no one says anything. That's true. You know, but I'm an attorney, so there's privacy and there's privilege considerations, but what can say not a non-parent do? Can they attend these coffees? Do they, and how do you find out who the guidance counselor is? Or is it better to just, Kai Quincy, just go to the police? Our police are terrific and they're aware of what's going on, but I'm sorry to go on and on and on. Since the SROs were pulled, not sort of indiscriminately, and I won't go into that now, there doesn't seem to be any connection between the student and somebody to help them on the spot. Yeah, no, definitely. I think if there's if if there's something happening on the spot and there's violence and there's you know bullying, then I th call nine one one. Like call the police. I think the police can definitely help. But um, but I also think that it's really important for, you know, like and that's where parents come in too. You know, like parents, we really need to take the time to to know what's going on at school with our kids. We need to take the time to talk with them listen to them and then when they say something especially if it's bullying or violence you know we need to reach out to the right people so but you it's know never Susan, to, it's never good to not say anything that's for sure you know i agree with you but i know the parents are a little bit overwhelmed given the economy and inflation uh many of my clients are working two jobs and these are professionals they work their day job as lawyer doctor and then they do something at night to supplement and what I hear is, well, I don't have the time. And what I say is, but you have to make the time. This is your child and your child's welfare. I don't know how to make time for you. I shoot an email. Just shoot an email. Um, you could even do it anonymously. I don't know how because I'm not proficient, but you could. But this is what I hear. Well, we're just too busy. And I don't think many in Brookline really believe that sexting is going on, which it is, particularly in the middle school. Or the trafficking is going on. I've had cases, and it is. And I don't think the police are on it. They know, but I'm not sure that the rest of us know. And I think we get frightened when we hear mental issues, mental challenges, mental illness. Hmm. How would you respond as a mom and as a professional? So, um, you know, I, in preparation for the show, I actually pulled some resources together and, you know, I really encourage anyone who's watching this, that if, if you sense there's any kind of, um, if you've noticed this in your kids, that they're just, you know, isolating, not eating, they're, you know, they're changing friend groups. They're kind of just, they're not their normal self, you know? maybe it's time to make a phone call. And I know that the Brookline Center here in Brookline, they have uh, an amazing resource. You know, they um, do the therapy for individuals, for children, for couples. Um, if you go on their website, you'd be amazed at um, all the different things that you can participate in. And, and they even have um, resources for people who can't afford it. So that, that's one resource. The other thing is, as we talked about earlier, and there's such a shortage of um, mental health providers. So I, I did a little digging, and oh, hold on for a second. When I went to went to when I went to get my dog, I put down my paper, and um, so I have it right here that if you you know make these phone calls and and you can't find a therapist because they're just booked beyond book mm -hmm. booked. 
these are some phone numbers and I'm happy to share it with you, Susan, but I can just uh, say a few things here. Um, you know, you can call this number, 617-720-2828 or email info at therapymatcher.com. And this therapy is- matcher, Is that therapymatcher.com, yes. okay. Therapy matcher. Okay. And, and this is like physicians share this um, information. Okay. So, so like, let's say whoever's watching hasn't been to a doctor because they're just too busy working. I'm mm -hmm. giving you the phone number right now, uh, 617-720-2828 or 1-800-242-9794. And there's another one here, um, Psychology Today. This is also a therapist finder and it's basically um you know you just it's psychologytoday.com but there's there's a lot of different phone numbers i have here there's a, the crisis crisis text line um it's 24 hour support for those in crisis all you have to do is text <coughs> text 741741 from anywhere in the US and you will receive an automated te text asking you about your situation um, can you send those to us and maybe maybe Dom could run them at the end of the show? Excuse me. Oh yes. dear. I think I better. Yeah, I'll, I'll email this to you, Susan. Go yeah, that would be um, but how long does it take for these organizations to find um a therapist or a social worker or some resource that can help? How long would it take? A week, two weeks, three weeks? You know, you I, I, I would think less than a week. I think, I mean, they are on it. Like this, the the um, phone numbers and emails on this, it was given to me by, um, you know, physicians in town. So it, 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 the turnaround's pretty quickly. Well, that's, that's good to hear. But I wonder if there's any um, respite coming up in the future so that there will be more resources because these young kids are really, really hurting. The longer it goes on, the more severe the hurt, the pain becomes. I know because I have a couple of clients who are victims of bullying and they haven't had any really good response from the resources that are available. And they're just sort of falling deeper and deeper in, I guess, the bullying pit. I don't know how else to phrase it. So um, I'm just wondering what we can do as a town mm -hmm. in addition to the resources. Well, and let me ask you, is the bullying happy, happening at school and then- yes. the and online. We we can't forget online. Yes. Right. Yeah. Well, definitely if it's happening at school, it, it needs to be reported. It has to be reported to the principals, to Dr. Linus Guillory. He's our superintendent. You know, so not saying anything is not the solution. It's the more we say and and you know, express what's what you're seeing, that's when we can find help for the victims. Well, that's really, really good advice. And I will certainly, I do pass it on, but I know there's resistance. And one of the things I hear, well, if I report it to the school, won't my kid be retaliated against? And I say, I hope not. No, I mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't really okay. know, but I think it's a fair question. Yeah. And, and I know that um, the principals, you know, they're trained, the guidance counselors are trained. And so, you know, like, this is sensitive information. So most guidance counselors, you know, the good ones, they know that kids can be retaliated upon, but maybe it's important for the parents to just even say that in the beginning, you know, this, we're reporting this, but this is anonymous. But in some cases, I actually know people who it's, it's so bad that it's not anonymous because there's kids who are bullying someone. So they have to like, you know, take the situation to the principal. And then it's the principal's right. job to help them mitigate this. Right. I'm wondering if there are any trainings um, in the schools with the students um, that this is bullying, this is sexting, this is not right. That's not why you come to school. We're here to keep you safe. Um, and for you basically to have a positive, joyous town, time in school. I'm just wondering, is there any training for students? You know, Susan, that's a really great point. And so what I want to say to that is, you know, I'm just going to kind of detour a little bit and then loop yeah, back to that question. 
So like ev at the end of the year, the Brookline schools, so the students, they take the uh, Massachusetts Young Risk Behavior Survey. What and is that? Okay, so basically it's a survey that all Brookline students, um, it's it's optional, but they're given this survey of, of many questions that ask them about bullying, ask them about substance abuse, ask them about their their safety. And, and of course, parents are given this, um, you know, they get an email saying, we're going to be doing this. If you don't want your, if you don't want our child, if you don't want your children to take the survey, they can opt out. But they take this survey and then the um, um, health department here, they take the information, they analyze it. And the BPEN, Brookline Parent Education Network, they get this information too. And, and then off of this survey, um, you know, Brookline, Brookline Health Department and the uh, Linus Gallery, they, they look at all this. And then there's a, um, a deputy curriculum coordinator who right. you know, they're, they're really supposed to take all this and then create programs or create curriculum that address this. So the survey is important, but then, you know, the next steps is very important too. The next step is we need to be with our times. We need to create curriculum that help our children like right now in real time. And so, and I will say this, Susan, like I, I sat on the um, Brookline Wellness Committee this year. And what is and that? I helped, Susan? What is that? So, so, so basically it's the, um, the director is um, Trisha Lahame. And, and so she has to get her um, team together and they look at the Brookline School's health and wellness policy. And so, you know, it's her job to look at it and see where the gaps are, see where the holes are. And so I was um, a parent that was on that committee and we did, we looked line by line at this committee and there definitely were some gaps and um, we created language to, you know, help with these things that we're talking about. It was like substance abuse. There was like marijuana abuse, alcohol abuse, uh, social e emotional issues that students have. So now, and now that this policy is, you know, we just kind of finished this like two weeks ago, but now that this mm -hmm. is done, this is going to be shared with Linus Guillory. This is going to be shared with all the, the leaders of Brookline schools. And then, you know, it's what they're going to do next. That's really important. So and and perhaps and that's why it's important for parents to reach out to their schools so that they you know like there's going to be meetings happening where where you have the superintendent and the principals guidance looking at this policy seeing like you know how can we roll this out what what can we do but the more parents speak out and say like this is what my kid is seeing then they the principals can then also come to the table and be like you know what we're seeing that in our schools too this is this is the feedback I'm getting. What about this idea? So it's it's definitely a big community effort. I hope so. I hope part of the policy that you were reviewing included included domestic violence because it was my experience a few years ago that the domestic violence curriculum established by the police, which is noteworthy in in our county, other other um, towns use it was totally dismantled in the Brookline schools. And they went back to using a 1999 health curriculum where they don't have the same kind of bonding with people who were doing the domestic violence work on a regular basis. So that's a big, big, big concern. But you're talk we're talking mainly about students, but what about the rest of us, the seniors, um, the Gen Xs and all of these different, the Ys, I don't even know which age is which age. I'm so confused, but... What about the mental health of, of the rest of the community? Yeah, no, it's, I mean, you know, if, if adults need mental help, then they really need to reach out and start at the Brookline Center. Start, like, try to, try to get a therapist. I think it's really important. The other thing is, um, from what I've read, you know, one thing that can really help with mental with mental health is um, socializing and being with other people, being with making an effort to be with other people, um, you know, like 
go to coffee with a friend, call someone, call a family member. But so, th so that's one of the solutions, you know, and, and maybe, um, I, I don't know, I'm just kind of brainstorming right now with you, but I mean, I hear that the um, senior center, I hear that they have different programs. Is Wonderful. That Wonderful program, Susan. I've just become aware of them. I'm on the board because I am a senior and I wanted to know what was wonderful one and terrific um, exercise. For instance, this Friday, I'm going to take a ballet class. I'm the biggest putz in the world. My parents pulled me from ballet. Waste of money, waste of time. But you know what? It's so beautiful. They have fabulous programs and they'll help. That's awesome. And may I suggest when you take that ballet class, Make sure you do a lot of stretching before and after. Well, I'm a yogi, so I don't really have to worry about that. But <laughs> okay. I'm just going to give it a shot. Um, but I'm just wondering how other talent, and they work. Let's say the average family of two, not necessarily of two, could be one, could be grandparents. They work so much, they don't have time to call a family member or to have coffee or to have dinner. But I guess they could learn to Zoom. They could use their phones. I don't know. Um, I don't know how we can bring the community together because there seems to be some divisiveness in the community now, which I won't get into. And I think it's important that the divisiveness be overcome quickly. I grew up in this town and I don't remember it being divisive. I'm sure it was. But I'm just wondering how, with your leadership, with your thoughts, how can we bring the community together? You know, Susan, um, thank you for that question. You know, I'm I'm definitely um, a person who likes to meet with people face to face. I feel like during COVID, you know, like when we had to turn to Zoom and a lot of things had to uh, go online. I mean, some people love it because, you know, you don't have to get into your car and drive and you could just like turn on the computer. Like, I like that. I love the fact that like, yeah, I could just turn on my computer but then also, you know, because the COVID happened for a few years and, you know, that um, you kind of lose touch with, you know, being with other people face to face. And now that we're kind of on the other side of COVID and things are kind of back to normal, you know, it's, I, th I think it's really important that we keep meeting together. And, and, you know, I am the, um, the vice president of the town meeting member association and uh, it was, okay. It was, yeah, it was really fun that like our our board, you know, we said, you know, our, let's have some meet and greets. We want to, you know, we haven't seen people for, we haven't seen our association in the last couple of years. It's all been over email. Let's get together. So we had two of those. And so I think people are, you know, starting to come back out and meet. And so I don't know, for, for me, like, I, I, I love hosting things. I love like when people get together and I love going to coffee with people. So I, I think I would just really make an effort to meet, greet, talk with people, listen, you know, connect people to other people. And I think that's really important now, especially with the mental health crisis. I absolutely agree. Being a domestic violence attorney five years ago, I would have never used the word mental health. Now, every single case has a mental health component, and I'm not sure I'm equipped to handle that component. And I state it when I'm in court to the judges. I judge, I'm not an expert. I'm not even trained. I'm trying on my own. And some of the judges says, we don't do with mental health in this courtroom. Oh, well, you do now, judge. I mean, this is what I'm presenting to you, and we need guidance. Um, Susan, would you be interested in hosting meet and greets in your precinct or just general meet and greets? with people and oh. how do you get the word out how do you get the word out yeah i mean you know nowadays we are everyone's emailing someone and we just share information we put it on facebook we make announcements through social media and so i mean that's the way to do it. and sometimes it's the good old-fashioned way you just pick up the phone and you, <laughs> and call, you call your friends invite people so you invite people in the last few minutes, I want to bring this up because it's a huge issue in domestic violence. This is Susan's book, How Puppies Make Me Feel. And I'm going to give a plug. It's sold at the Booksmith. I bought it for the holidays for my little six-year-old grandnephew who has a big old Burmese mountain dog who had to have a leg amputated. 
and then had to go through chemo and thank God is fine now. And I spoke with him on Sunday and I said, Georgie, how's Gouda? That's the name of the dog. And he said, good is good, but he's not perfect, which I thought was a lovely response. Animals are very much a part of domestic violence it's because the perpetrator oftentimes will begin to abuse the animals because they want to scare the kids, they want to scare the victim, and that's now part of a restraining order. If a restraining order is issued and the attorney asks or the victim asks and they say, please include my puppy Bailey or Quincy, the judges will do it. What made you write this book, How Puppies Make Me Feel? <laughs> well... So we ended up getting our puppy right before COVID on January 1st, actually. We picked him up on January 1st. And then when the world shut down in March, you know, we just had this furry little love bug and we, our family just thinks the world of him and we've had so much fun with him. And, you know, it's having had Quincy, our dog, it just brings out so many feelings, you know, like feelings of love and happiness, but also frustration when they do things that are naughty, you know? So um, as I was, you know, I was writing a few other books at the time. <laughs> really? And, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll show them to you in a second, but, you know, I just thought that I would love to make um, um, a picture book for young people that helps them connect their feelings with, with the words you know, so that they can name their feelings because, you know, and, and I think when kids are, when they grow up knowing their feelings and naming their feelings and be able to speak their feelings then we've given them tools, you know? And um, so then that's, I put the book together because I thought of all the feelings that, that I would feel with my puppy in, in the good and the bad. And I, I put that mm -hmm. in there and then, um, and then at the very end, the last couple of pages, um, the dog, the character, the dog is naughty. And then there's some pages in there about feelings of frustration. And, and I put these feelings, negative feelings, because I wanted kids to know, and adults, when they read with their kids, you know, that the negative feelings are normal. You know, everyone's going to have the, the good and the bad. But then the very last page, well, I don't want to give it away. Don't give it away. Don't give it away. Because it's a, it's a charming little book, and I agree with you, and I see the therapy dogs that come in where I substitute teach, and there's an instantaneous change in the patients. Instantaneous. They come alive. They're on the floor. They want a pet. They want, they're just so engaged. Otherwise, they're really not. They're really into themselves. We're talking to Susan Park, citizen Brookline, citizen author, activist, engaged in the town. Any last words, Susan? Susan, I just want to thank you for hosting a show like this because I it just it just really shows how much you care for our community. And I just want to thank you. You're wonderful. Yeah, well, we have to thank Brookline Interactive Group. They carried this show through COVID. I don't know how many people watched. I think it's picking up now because they shoot the show. Uh, it's on cable. It's on big. Usually, I think I think on Wednesdays at 1130, I'm not sure, but they also shoot it out over YouTube and you're free to do that too. Susan Park, I hope you'll come back. It's been a pleasure. It's always a pleasure with you, Susan. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. And that's it for the safety net on this very, very tiny bit of snow, snowy day that we saw in Brooklyn. Tiny bit. It was actually quite pretty. Bye, everybody. See you next time. Bye. Bye.